my kids to call you mommy. Assalamu alaikum my brother. Wa alaikum assalam my brother. How are you today? I'm well bro. Always I, good. You Always look good. good. You look Thank well. You. Look Feeling well fit. Good. Feeling good. A little bit overworked but uh, uh, come, comes with the territory. You have this thing of yours that you always say hardly working hard. What? Uh fuck how does it go now? <laughs> working hard or hardly working. Yo, you always on some my time that balance. I feel you. Know, you I feel you. work 25 hours a day. A day. Um kind of just have to keep the pace slow, slow. and steady um and over time it, it will become something but i guess in the infancy of the journey that's where you look like you just adamantly just like putting in putting in putting in putting yeah. in putting in it's been a long time of that i get you um, working in silence trying to get those 10,000 hours 20,000 hours in um take me back to the beginning of how those 10 ta- 10,000 hours began cuz i think lots of people that are introduced to you right now sort of like relate your emergence into the space oh this guy was so lucky oh but they don't know that like you know this was a layered um journey <laughs> of so many confusions mm-hmm. letdowns disappointments ups and downs mm-hmm. um but like let's first begin to the family setup um your family's part of the first colored families to you know move into the white sort of like constantia you know neighborhoods which yeah. is like a different which was a different time back mm-hmm. then mm-hmm. um take me through um uh, your grandparents is obviously in the trade um tell me more about like their influences and how that sort of trickled down to um you finding yourself in the space you're finding yourself in right now so yeah i mean as you mentioned the, the mm. exposure to both the creative and the business and academic sides stemmed from my grandparents who are unfortunately no longer with us so may they be granted the highest places in paradise um but yeah man growing up um grew up or was born in um Crawford um my mom had a place there and she was supporting my dad while he was completing his studies um but even before that uh, my my grandfather uh, on my dad's side um he was a baker uh, they were based up in Joburg for uh, during that time and um he moved down to Cape Town when things weren't really working out for him um so he left his family in Joburg and moved down with my dad i think my dad was about 14 15 years old um and he tried to find a career for him uh, in Cape Town um and eventually he settled on menswear retail um he founded uh, a shop called Skipper Bar um mm. which grew to about 20 stores nationwide and if you chat to a lot of the older generation um they will be aware of of what skipper bar meant i mean from Florsham shoes grasshoppers nevada trousers all that og shit um that sort of encapsulated the style for for both black people and non black people of color um so even before i was born that influence and that inspiration was there i guess um on my mother's side both my 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 grandmother and my grandfather were in the trade as well my grandfather was a dressmaker um and he made a lot of pieces for the emerging political class um whereas my grandmother was more in the factory setting um managing factories and production and that sort of thing so that influence really from the business side and from the creative side um was what I was born into. Um so born in Crawford, lived there for about 2 years. Um and because my grandfather had, on my dad's side had experienced um success in terms of his business, it allowed him to provide uh, an opportunity for my dad and his older brother to get an education. My dad ended up becoming a doctor. Um and because of that familial success uh, my grandfather managed to buy property um somewhat of a legal loophole mm. in Constantia and so after about 2 years my cuz cuz it was unheard of for colored and brown yeah. black people to yeah. occupy that space i mean because we we moved into the area um at that time it was about 1990 1992 i was born in 92 by the mm. way um yeah as you said it wasn't allowed um sort of at the end of apartheid um it still still wasn't a thing mm. it still considered a white neighborhood mm. and so yeah we were one of the first families of color to move into the area 
um, and it wasn't exactly well received. Um, How was it growing up in that environment as a kid? Um, no, obviously, most of your family was still in areas like Crawford, um, Athlone, right? Mm. Yeah. Um, how all was it? Town, all over Cape Town, yeah, really. But predom- predominantly. All in, all in colored. Because obviously your mom is from Buka, right? Yes, yeah. Yes, yes. So like, how was it growing up in that? Were you always away, like, of your surroundings? No, not necessarily. Really? Yeah. I think, I think as a young kid, um, mm. your environment is just your environment. Mm. is what you take in, right? Mm. Um, I think it's, it's when you grow up, um, and when you have a certain level of consciousness that you're aware mm. of of the certain dynamics in in that area, um, but yeah, I mean it, it wasn't exactly well received. Like I said, there was there was a, you know police coming to the door trying to find out you know what's happening. Yeah, mm. but, you know during that transition period, you could kind of apartheid was at an end, so you could get away with it, I guess. And they and they knew they my my dad's family um, had certain connections with the ANC. Mm. So then you sort of the, the development of, of how apartheid was coming to an end. Mm. Um, so for me, it was more just about living and experiencing my environment. Mm. Um, and because my family um, has always been in fashion, mm. I grew up with Vogue and Harper's Bazaar on the table. Um, my mother was also in the trade, my aunt, uncle. Mm. So everybody was kind of in this, in this trade. Um, and at the time, sort of 80s, 90s, mm. or, or towards the 90s, the, our, our rag trade in South Africa took a bit of a nosedive mm. because Chinese mass manufacture came onto the mm. market. And because our manufacturing setup here was very much geared towards mass manufacture accounts, we couldn't compete for price point or for time or whatever the case may be uh, with China. So the industry itself really didn't do so well. I mean, even up until now, right? Mm. Um, the last year or the, over the past few years, there have been a lot of the last sort of big manufacturers that have been closing mm. down. That is starting to change and we'll touch on that a bit later. Mm. But yeah, man, that was just my environment growing up. Amongst um, amongst this environment, you're obviously becoming of age and you sort of like drawing an understanding of what life means to you. Um, you an academic first. People don't know this. <laughs> you, you head into engineering. After engineering, you say property. After property, you say fashion. Um, was your parents reluctant to send you to fashion after so after bearing so much loss in the industry itself? Mm-hmm. Were they sort of like protective over you as their child, not wanting you to step in a place of so much unpredictability? unfairness because i mean like we can't compete against china you know that's just the reality of the situation so um was it intentional for you to do all of these other sort of like um educational practices first before heading into the creative side yeah i mean i think it it was always for me about a balance um i think the losses that i had seen people incur in um, your family? In my family. Mm. Um, a lot of them didn't have the business skill. Mm. Um, a lot of them only had the creative skill. Um, so when I finished high school, I was like, okay, what can I do that will allow me to have a creative output, but then at the same time to create a viable career? Because mm. as you say at the time, or even now, fashion... Um, was never really considered mm. a smart career path. Mm. Um, so w- when it came to engineering, I, I, I decided on mechatronic engineering, so the engineering of robotics, um, because the idea of making robots or software systems for cars or whatever the case may be was all design-related and, and was a creative output for me. Um, but that the, the foundations of engineering... Um, didn't really sit well with me. Mm. Um, and also the format of, of the education and how it was taught, like 200 kids in a class, you kind of just sit there, you mm. listen, and then you leave and you have to ingest. Mm. Um, whereas I prefer learning via mm. sort of a back and forth. Mm. So I had gotten ac- academically excluded um, from engineering after two years because I just couldn't find my feet within the, within the, the discipline. Mm. So... I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Like I said, pa- fashion has always been a passion and an, and an inspiration for me. And even at that time, I would I would always want to make, I always had this idea of wanting to make what I liked because mm. I could never find it here. Um, but then after like some guidance from my family, um, 
we decided that um, real estate was a good um, a good sort of knowledge base to have because mm. you know land ownership we know mm. um, is the foundations of one's livelihood or wealth, mm. and obviously that's a that's a real big issue in mm. this country. Maybe we'll touch on that a bit later. But to come back to it, um, I I then decided to pursue that as as a career path, mm. um, which is also a design discipline. Mm. Um, I mean, spatial design, architectural design, mm. um, urban design, mm. um, all come into play when we talk about discipline of real estate mm. sciences. Mm. Um, and what was interesting about that, and and I always likened it to fashion at the time, mm. was that it's, there's a creation of a product. Mm. Right? And when it comes to the creation of a product, there are many hands in the mm. process. Mm. Um, so like... With, with property, you have your architects, mm. your civil engineers, your quantity mm. surveyors, your contractors, mm. etc. Um, and so the same thing can be said with fashion. Mm. There are designers, there are pattern makers, mm. there are production houses, mm. manufacturers, CMTs, as they mm. call them. Um, so for me, I always had this vision of wanting to create a product, um, wanting to make sure that it's commercially viable, mm. and wanting to manage the process of hands. Mm. Um, so that that was why I decided on real estate rather than say architecture. Mm. Architecture has always been a love of mine, mm. but I didn't want to be the person that works. How can I say, like, like with a head down, mm. working on the product. Mm. I, I, I'm a I'm a people person, so mm. I like to work with the different individuals mm. to to have that vision then come out at the end. Mm. Which brings me to my next question. What do you think, in your opinion, then, makes something more than a... What makes a product more than just a product? It's funny because we actually discussed this in the, the first time we shot this. <laughs> uh, for those who don't know, we actually, we've tried to shoot this thing uh, on, an, on a number of occasions. <laughs> but, you know, the time is right, finally. And we have the opportunity to sit here today. Um, so what makes a product more than a product? I think... I was having this conversation with someone else the other day and, and we were saying that good design is everywhere. Uh, bad design is also everywhere. Um, but in order for us to, before we, before we get there, as we say, good design is everywhere and we live in a world where we are, we are fed this idea of you've got to have the latest iPhone, mm. you've got to have the latest pair of shoes, mm. you've got to you know, acquire all these different material objects mm. in order to acquire social status mm. in the western world mm. so for me when it came to creating product it was more about addressing something mm. so when it comes to real estate mm. what what am i addressing what space am i creating uh, what problem am i solving mm. and again there, there's so many issues when it comes to housing and land and, and ownership in this country and I would like for my solution to lie within that mm. paradigm or, mm. or parameter. Mm. Um, and the same thing with fashion. Mm. Right? We know the issues with fast fashion. Mm. We know that um, people are consuming way too much. Mm. So I had to really apply my mind to, okay, if I'm going to create this product, mm. how am I going to make sure that it doesn't add to the problems that we face? Mm. So... The, the first thing that I wanted to address was this idea of representation and identity. Um, and I've learned this from figureheads within the industry, mm. um, like Tebe, Lucanio, Wanda, um, who have installed their own identity as well as the broader South African identity within their practice, um, from their own perspective, of mm. course. And there was no one really that looked like me that was doing it within the luxury space. Mm. We had um, elements of it within the street culture, mm. and obviously that is a big inspiration for me as mm. well. Um, but within the luxury sort of high fashion mm. space, um, there was no one really that looked like me. Mm. And I think also what I wanted to do address was the fact that, you know, my people have, or my ancestors, mm. have been here for 400 years mm. or so, uh, but when I travel to places like the UK or Europe or mm. America, um, people don't consider me as an African person. Mm. People consider me as Asian or whatever the fuck they call it. How the fuck um, does that make you feel, bro? I mean, I understand because 
that's where people that look like me come from. That's where we come from. But I've not spent much time in those areas. I don't really know the culture that mm. is specific to that location. Of mm. course, our culture here has influences mm. and has carried traditions from there, but it's very unique and it's very different specifically mm. to Cape Town. Mm. Um, so that's what I want, want to do with this with my work was mm. to showcase African Africanism or, mm. or an African identity mm. from a different perspective, mm. from my perspective mm. and, and my experience growing up. Mm. Interesting, bro. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that context. Given the opportunity, since you obviously f definitely had a passion for um, property and property development and understanding, you know, this land conversation, what are your thoughts on the state of the RDP system in South Africa? And when you speak of solutions and when you speak of developing a product, um, how would you describe a, a solution to this product that we call RDP? which is we actually one of the only countries in the world that has a government system that actually redistribute houses for their people. Um, I'm, I stand to be corrected, but like the last time I heard Obaba Jacob Zuma speak, that's the only fact I took out of his con <laughs> conversation. But please, my brother, I'm keen to hear your thoughts on this. I, I think so. So there are lots of sort of social uh, and government subsidized programs all over the world, including South Africa. Mm. Um, and some of what we have like these different subsidy programs do work. On paper, um, on they paper. look super um, beautiful. And Very brilliant and ideas. I think when we talk yeah. about solution, it's difficult for someone like me to mm. propose a solution because I don't come from it. Mm. I've had exposure, yes. Um, mm. And I, I, I mean, I dare to use the word grateful to have that exposure mm. and that experience because I think you can go your whole life in Cape Town mm. without seeing the reality of the place that we live in. Mm. Um, so... Perhaps I won't touch too much on a solution. Mm. I think That's for me to be able to propose a solution would have to be a lot in a in a much more collaborative environment mm. Mm. from people who really understand the dynamic the of living mm. within those areas. But to come back to RDP as a product, mm. um, it's it's extremely flawed mm. um, from an urban design point of view. Mm. Um, Can you begin by explaining sure. what is ur urban sure. design? So, so when we talk about urban design, we essentially take a spatial product and we say okay what is this spatial product in relation to around it mm. so when you talk about a house a house is not a house just because it's four walls with a couple of rooms it's a house that's close to transport mm. it's close to economic opportunity mm. it's close to schools mm. you know so so when we talk about urban design um, we talk about how different products or, or spaces communicate with one another to provide a dignified mm. way of living. Mm. Um, so to ca we'll come back to RDP as a product, I say it's flawed because firstly, it's it's one house, one family, mm. right? which means that if we're going to provide housing for 200 families, you need quite a large mass of land mm. in order to be able to do that. Um, so by default, it immediately puts people on the periphery of the city. Mm. Right? So, so people have to spend more on transport. I mm. mean, people already love like that, but mm. the idea is to remove some of those frictions or barriers, mm. right? So, when it comes to RDP, the the land requirement, as I said, is, is huge. Mm. So, you, you're sort of pushing people to the edge of the city. Mm. Um, and then, the way that they construct it, is, I mean, there's been so many reports on mm. construction, cutting of corners, mm. and South African government mm. at the end of the day. So mm. the, the product itself is not really well made mm. um, and the design principles don't go beyond building four walls. Mm. Um, so that's why I think there are new ways of thinking, new technologies mm. that can be implemented in arriving at a solution mm. for land ownership, for adequate mm. housing. Um, and the same thing can be said for healthcare, for, mm. for energy production, mm. you know, for, with load shedding and things. Mm. We shouldn't have this problem in the modern day, mm. but hopefully through the next 20 years, 10 years, 5 years, we'll see some innovation and some technology being applied to these different spaces to, to you know, create something a little bit less frustrating mm. than what we mm. experience now. Mm. As a young creative South African man who has so many passions of wanting to contribute, you mentioned earlier emblems of who you are, mm. uh, a, a, a 
re- a much more refreshed and refri- refined representation of your people mm. in a very like luxurious um tradition heritage centric way um how important is it for you to have south african emblems in what you do i think it's the most important thing um i think authenticity in a narrative in a creative output has to be sort of reflective um on something and for me it was always just this is what i know this is what i've grown up with this is the story that i can tell that i don't believe has been told accurately um and again like i said i've learned that from so many other people i mean lucanio i think is I've shout out Lucanio by the way. Flowers. Um, Flowers. Lucanio is also the first person to buy one of your famous <laughs> trousers. <laughs> we'll we'll you talk about yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean the way that he portrays people in in almost this like mm. royal aspect. I think something that really influenced me. Mm. Um because again when you talk about colored culture mm. it's it's very closely uh, linked to street culture mm. and there are you know positives and negatives mm. to that but again when i was at school and we we would wear nike's jordans mm. lebrons mm. um at a white school like sax mm. um, which was founded by Cecil John Rhodes mm. by the way. we'll be touch on that mm. in a second but um the the response of the dress or mm. the way we spoke um from the majority white population mm. was always very negative. I mean you I think it's mm. something that they never really understood mm. and I, I think perhaps that's changed mm. now but at the time in junior school um it was a, it was a weird experience. Mm. Um so I wanted to remove the box of street culture mm. from how we perceive ourselves and how we 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 are perceived by others. Mm. Wow. You wanted to remove the, box. the box the box because i mean culture box i mean yeah the, the street it, it's so tricky mm. because like there's so many inspirations and foundations mm. and things when it comes to street mm. culture mm. i mean i after i graduated with on uh, with my honors degree mm. i worked at the corner store mm. um and i mean that in and of itself even before that smith mm. abrams was such a, a keystone mm. in our creative culture mm. obviously geared around street culture mm. And again, I, I learned so much. I, I interned under Shukri Joel, mm. the owner and creative director of I and I. Mm. Again, like what an incredible person to learn from. Tell the children um, who <laughs> Shukri is. It's so difficult to to describe the caliber. Please, um, s- s- but but mm. Shukri is someone who, who's of the previous generation of creatives. Not to give away his age too much. Mm. Shout out Shukri, but um. um yeah man very very i mean he also grew up with a tailoring background mm. his father was a tailor and he was mm. you know trained as a tailor by default mm. um very influenced by the by the japanese design movement um and so in that pocket of quote unquote streetwear at the corner store there was this individual who was incorporating tailoring into the conversation mm. incredible shirts incredible fabrications um uh, incredible cuts of trousers and uh, again in those tailoring techniques really just elevated the product in a different way and i'm sure that a lot of people will now be able to see that mm. difference in my own work when when it comes to shirts and tailored trousers mm. and, the, and the like so yeah man so 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 studying or learning under shukri as a design intern um aside from just the product itself i think mm. it taught it it influenced my outlook mm. um shukri is someone who who is very open to everyone mm. um, one of the most humble individuals that I've had the pleasure of meeting and he's like an older brother to mm. me um so to learn from someone like that um was really the perfect way for me to start gaining formal knowledge in fashion mm. um and to apply that outlook to everything else that I want to do mm. um and then everybody else within that space mm. from the brand owners themselves to the individuals and the mm. youngsters who were coming in and out of the store mm. i think really set the president the president rather mm. for what we saw happen after that mm. space mm. um so when the corner store closed um i moved to a, to a bags company mm. um because i wanted to learn not only about apparel but about accessories mm. as well 
sell leather product and sporting goods mm. in the form of bags and travel accessories. Um, I worked as a designer there for about a year. Um, and again, the the sort of balance between business practice and creative practice mm. um, was I've, I've always just tried to maintain that balance mm. partially to to to, um, mm. to make my parents happy mm. but, but also because I saw this thing constantly of mm. people having such creative ability mm. but failing due to not having the business knowledge or infrastructure mm. to support them in the long term mm. um, so Around about that time, I wanted to further my studies and mm. to get that experience overseas. Mm. So I was looking at various institutions across Europe and America and mm. stuff. And initially, I wanted to do luxury brand management mm. um, because I wanted to apply this concept not just to fashion products, mm. but again to, to all products mm. that, that I have a hand in. Mm. Um, so my brother, um, personally, I would say your dissertation when you were doing your MBA at Central St. Mont was the guiding principle and the vehicle behind the launch of your brainchild, Asa Sedan. In your dissertation, I've had the honor of reading it, you speak about a lot of influences, mm -hmm. um, the likes of Virgil, um, some um, Japanese... Moji. Moji. Yeah. Um, even many more, um, but I think the, the area I want to touch on is um, how some of your garments were inspired by... In fact, before we get to the garments element or the inspiration behind or the let's dissertation... Let's talk about, about that CSM let's, experience. Let's talk about um, that, yeah. Because I think, yeah. as I mentioned, it, yeah. it was always seen as this unattainable thing for people who look like us and mm. come from where we come from. Mm. Um, and when I came across the course, I was like, fuck it, let me, let me try my mm, life. And I mm. sort of abandoned all ideas of other courses. Mm. Like, let me try this one. Mm. Um, and so, you know, long story short, I managed to get in, um, which in and of itself was a crazy achievement. Mm. Uh, because a lot of the people who I had looked up to mm. in, the, in the global creative space. Had Alexander come McQueen, Samuel Ross. Samuel Ross. Samuel, Samuel Ross wasn't at, at Saint Central St. Martin's, e? but he did work with Central oh, St. Okay. in the Cold War. But For sure. As you mentioned, um, mm. Phoebe Philo, Fee uh, mm. Alexander McQueen, Craig mm. Green, Kim Jones, mm. uh, John Galliano. Mm. Um, Kim Jones. <laughs> uh, shout out to uh. Kim Jones. But um, mm. yeah, man, like I said, because of the the weight of the individuals that mm. have come from this place, mm. it was never really seen uh, or I never really saw it as something that could be a reality. Mm. So when I got in, it was a crazy achievement for me, um, particularly for an MBA. I mm. think most people do MBAs later on in their career. Mm. Um, and, and, and again, MBA um, as a concept is very traditional. Um, when you go to graduate schools of business, it's, you know, to, to formalize the business mm. process, whereas the CSM program was very different. Um, it was this idea again, and this is why it suited me so well, was mm. to blend the creative and artistic practice mm. with the business practice mm. so that we can, like, how can I say, introduce more creativity mm. uh, into solution generation. Mm. So when we look at problems, it always requires a creative process. Solution. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. solution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's what the, the MBA itself was really geared towards. So For it's sure. actually a collaboration between university of the arts london mm. and the university of london wow and then the colleges below that was obviously central Saint yes Martins yes and the college of Birkbeck. for sure um so that that process was crazy because mm. i arrived there in september 2019 and i and i got the exposure and the experience of you know what being a student at, at a mm. school like this is mm. like um and aside from the school just being in london seeing mm. all the galleries mm. and the shops mm. and you know, being able to fucking touch it up, mm. so garments and Moshella garments. Mm. Um, it was a, it was so like eye opening mm. um, as an experience. Because mm. um, that like was during, happened. yeah, that was during the time when you'd send like videos of like crazy <laughs> person of like, yo, <laughs> my boy, and it was like in the heap 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 of COVID. So yeah, so I arrived just mm. about six months before COVID. Mm. Um, arrived at in, yeah, in yes, UK, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, like I said, I got to experience the life on that side. Mm. Um, and that was incredible. Mm. Um, 
being at an institution like that, mm. working across disciplines with the fine arts students, mm. with the fashion students, mm. and even with different colleges. I don't mm. know, sure if you know, like I didn't know this when I went there, but the the university setup there is a little bit different. So you have the main university, and then with under uh, under that banner, I guess, are different colleges. So with UAL, the University of the Arts, you have Central Saint Martins, but you also have London College of Fashion. London College of Communications and a couple of others. So even working across those campuses was crazy mm. um, to just get like inspiration and to learn from people from other mm. practices. Mm. But then COVID happened, mm. um, which was which was wild. Um, mm. At the time, you know, lockdown was meant to be what two or three weeks or so. Mm. Um, and I think in the back of my mind, I always saw it being longer than mm. that. I didn't really realize mm. how long. But the conversation that I had with my family at the time was like, do I come back or do mm. I just you know, see it through? Mm. Everything went online, so mm. there was no real need for me to mm. be there. Um, but I decided I decided to stay. Mm. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that, and to not go into too much depth, but I think it's worth mentioning. Yeah. Um, that it was approaching the month of Ramadan, which is, uh, as you know, um, our holy month where we fast, and it's a, it's a time of heightened spirituality, and it's the month that the Quran was revealed about 600 years ago or so. So at that time, trying to seek the guidance from you know people close to me, uh, my father gave me a, a translation of a Quran, which is our holy book, our Bible, um, and, and in that Quran, they talk about the, the, our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Um, he would put himself into voluntary isolation every year mm. to, to gain um, solitude mm. um, and, and to self-reflect. Mm. Um, and so when I read this Quran that my dad gave me, um, it opens up with that, right? Mm. To, to give context to how this book was revealed mm. to him because it was revealed to him in that time of isolation. Mm. And so I really tried to take that as a message um, of this is my isolation, mm. this is my time to self-reflect, this is my time to, mm. to learn more about myself and mm. to learn more about where I come from. Mm. Um, and I've always tried to, I always try to use the platform of CSM to, yeah. to interrogate that. Yeah. So, I mean, I did a piece on RTP housing, I did yeah. a piece on, on sort of uh, developed economy yeah. governance versus emerging yeah. economy governance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so using all of the opportunities with CSM to to really like drill down on what I saw mm. my outlook mm. to be. Um, so when it came to lockdown, it was just like, shit, I I was lucky that I had studying to sort of keep me grounded and keep me mm. focused and sort of keep that forward momentum. Mm. I think a lot of people struggled with just being stuck mm. in that space, which is really difficult. Mm. I mean, I, it was the first time living on my own. Yeah. And the UK lo lockdown ended up being like four months. Yeah. So I didn't see or interact with people for four months aside from uh, digitally. For sure. And um, obviously this is the time when you're working on your dissertation. Yeah. Yeah, around about there. And um, you also like... And finishing other finishing projects. Other projects of, um, yeah, yeah. But I think the dissertation came sort of towards the latter half of lockdown. No, yeah. I mean, the, the total lockdown, I mean, we know spanned over can the... We, uh, can we, can um, we touch on, 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 on the dissertation sure, at large? Sure, sure. Um, so, so, the dissertation... I mean, before I went to the UK, I always wanted to start this brand. I actually tried to start the brand in 2015, 2016 um, with family, with friends, on my own. Um, and I couldn't quite get it right. Mm. So that journey of gaining knowledge then started after the mm. corner store, etc. Mm. Um, so with that in mind, that was always what I wanted to use the MBA as a platform mm. for, to sort of test that idea mm. of not just the fashion brand, but a, a multidisciplinary conglomerate. For sure. Uh, inspired by your LVMHs, your caring groups and shit Yes, like yes, yes. Um, so when it came to the dissertation, initially I pitched this idea of a, of a massive African-based conglomerate, mm. uh, product-based mm. conglomerate. Um, and my supervisor was like, oh, you need to slow down. You, mm. know? <laughs> um, you, you need to find the starting point. Mm. Um, so I had to kind of work backwards. I had a project, a film project that we shot in 2019 with um, a good friend of mine, Tariq Dolly. Flowers. Um, flowers, flowers. To, to, to Tariq. Um, who and Junaid. Always, always believed in mm. the vision. And Junaid was a mm. part of that as well. 
um, Jason, Jason. as well. Mm. Um, and that project never actually got released, mm. but I presented it as one of the three art mm. projects for my dissertation. But I, I really needed to position or, or to interrogate myself w- and, and using the dissertation as, as that platform. Mm. So with, I, that, what, with that interrogation, what sort of realizations did you make? So remember I said that I, I always wanted to create um, a representation. Mm. And so I had to really root. So, so the way the dissertation works is you have to really justify your idea mm. by doing research. Mm. So the research, and we'll try and brush this quickly, although it's, it's, it's a fairly detailed yeah. document, which I would like to publish at some point. Mm. But So we started off with looking at um, early modernist art movements, um, predominantly Dadaism and Bauhaus, um, again, to balance the art and design mm. principles, mm. which which were which arose um, sort of around the time of the First World War and mm. post-First World War, where the world was in a state of turmoil, mm. the same as it is now. Mm. And that was the idea, is to, to compare that time with this mm. time. Um, so those movements really stood for social change mm. and for subversion and for anti-war mm. um, and And this idea of the the greater work of art, mm. which essentially means that it's bigger than all of us. Mm. You know, we say that all the all time. All the time. Like, this is what we're experiencing mm. now. Everybody has their role to play. Every individual mm. has their own path. Mm. Um, but the, the collective aspect mm. of it is so much more powerful. I think Lucanio said it really mm. nice at the end of his speech at LVMH. Mm. can't remember the quote exactly. Um, but but it, it's, the, it's, the powers, the pa- the powers of a collective is more powers is more powerful than the pa- than the powers of the oh, singular. Yes, I yeah, think just the, the power of the collective is greater than the power of the individual. Um, so, yeah. so Dadaism and, and, and even Bauhaus mm. um, were really rooted in that mm. um, experience. Mm. Um, and so we started off there with the early 20th century mm. um, art movements. And then what I wanted to do is create this chronological order of how this practice has been taken over the past 50, 100 years. Mm. And, uh, and, and how can I put it into today's context? Mm. So from there, we moved into the post. So for, for those who don't know, modernism was loosely the period of 1850. Mm. Um, and these particular movements were in the early mm. 1900s. Mm. So, post World War II, um, sort of towards more, more towards the 1940s, mm. um, and then into the postmodern era, mm. we had um, Dieter Rams, mm. who, was, who was probably one of the most famous product designers. Um, so, really looking at how he took modernism into his time yeah. um, with principles like reductive design, mm. um, like slow consumption, mm. like non trend based product development. Mm. Um, and alongside the Western practice, mm. guys like Dieter Rams, mm. we had the Eastern practice, mm. um, which and, and my case study for that was uh, Muji, mm. um, which is a Japanese um, design company mm. that does everything from fucking stationery to mm. housing itself. And the reason for me juxtaposing Eastern versus Western practice mm. is because that's what South Africa is. Like mm. Obviously, we have the indigenous community, mm. but we have the, the influence of the West, which... Mm topic of discussion for mm. another day but we also have the influences from the east, east because with with the east to west trade routes we had slave slave trade into south africa um predominantly from the indonesia and malaysia mm. areas um which is my mom's area, which mm. um so that so that was the reason for me wanting to sort of mm. create that that comparison between eastern mm. and western practices mm. um so with when it comes to muji Again, it's a, it's a similar idea of holistic uh, design that doesn't put pressure on an individual to buy the latest this or that, mm. or to fill one's home mm. with all the latest Muji shit. Mm. It was more about creating product that serves and that can be interpreted mm. by the individual mm. um, in any way they see fit. So, mm. so uh, for me, it is a little bit more, uh, or a lot more respectful mm. of the individual consumer mm. um, to create product in this way. Mm. Um, and so from, from Dieter Rams and Kenya Hara, who's the, who's mm. the art director of Muji, mm. uh, we then moved into the contemporary. So we went mm. from modernism to postmodernism to the contemporary. Contemporary, yeah. And, and there we looked at 
my case study at least was the Kanye effect, um, where as extreme as the individual is pushing the boundaries of design, whether it's sound design or product design or, I mean, even Kanye's housing projects have always been about pushing the boundaries. Um, but the Kanye effect, what I called it, um, was how he then took some of these ideologies into the now, but not only did he create the platform for himself, but he created the platform for everybody who came after him mm. and that worked under him. So we saw Don C, we saw... Virgil, Virgil Abloh. Of course, the legendary, mm. uh, rest mm. in peace to, to Virgil. Mm. Um, and as an extension of Virgil, we had Matthew Williams, mm. we had Samuel Ross. Mm. And so I took a little bit of each individual, predominantly focusing on Kanye and then Virgil and then Samuel, mm. of, of how their practices sort of find the intersection between commerce, design, and art. Mm. Um, but, to, but to use that model in, in my context, mm. I had to, at the same time, do a, an historical analysis of mm. South Africa's colonialism. Mm. So, and what I wanted to really put focus on was how important South Africa was to the Western economy, mm. the global economy. Tell them about the Dutch Indian Company. So, I mean, a, a lot of it us like, would have yeah. heard about Jan van Rijen for sure, for and sure. the Dutch East India Company. Yeah. And the same about Cecil John Rhodes. It was the biggest company ever. In human history. In yes. human history. Um, and I, and I, again, that I wanted to shed a lot of light on this because we, we see South Africa as this little Pop, place at the pocket, bottom of the yeah. earth. That's not really has it doesn't have any relevance to the rest of the world, mm. but it, it couldn't be further from the truth. Mm. And I think we we were almost taught that idea um, when we were taught about Jan van Riebeek mm. and the Dutch East India Company mm. and the same thing with Cecil Rhodes and De Beers and Anglo mm. America. Mm. Uh, we taught about these individuals as figureheads, mm. and we hold them to high esteem mm. in the, in the sort of hegemony or the, mm. or the traditional way of teaching. But when you really look into the history of it, it couldn't be further from the truth. Mm. And so I wanted to tell that story differently. Mm. Um, and I wanted to show showcase the realities of mm. the situation, of the oppression. Mm. And this we know, right? Mm. But I think what really put it into context for me was when I learned how important this enterprise mm. was to the global economy and still is to today. Mm. So when you look at the Dutch East India, for, for example, the Dutch East India Company, um, it was the biggest company of all time. Mm. Um, to put it into context, it's roughly about four times the size of what Apple is today, mm. if you put it into its present value. Mm. And a lot of that wealth then got um, absorbed by the Dutch Empire. Mm. Same thing with the British, right? Mm. Um, with Cecil John Rhodes and his endeavors here, mm. whether it's agriculture and viticulture, mm. you know, mining and that sort of mm. thing. All of that, that wealth that was extracted then went to feed the British Empire, mm. which was actually funded by the Rothschilds. But that's a Too soon, too soon, too soon, too soon. <laughs> <laughs> so so with, yeah. that, with that history in mm. mind, mm. Um, and obviously the East versus West, mm. thing, and that's how my people, mm. my ancestors came to be in South mm. Africa, um, I really had to sort of position those streams of research, which were separate, I had to bring them together. Mm. And so that then in broad brush strokes, mm. I mean, there's so much detail to this, but in broad brush strokes brought me to my practice mm. um, of creative product creation mm. um, with this narrative mm. installed on both the creative side and, and the historical side. So I then presented three projects. The one, as we know, is Asa Sadan, mm. named after my grandmother. Um, but I also presented a short film as well as... Um, a chair design. Let's talk about Asa all, Sadan. All with this narrative yeah. in mind, but you know, none of that has been released mm. yet, and we will get to that at For some sure. point. But with Asa, what I wanted to do was is was present this narrative in garment format, and not just in garment format, but in brand format. So aside mm. from the pieces themselves, the way that we shoot, the people mm. that we shoot, and the narrative within these creative outputs. Mm. Uh, all has to have to be synergized. Mm. Um, so I actually came down to South Africa um, at the end of 2020 when we managed to get out of the country because I hadn't seen my family mm. for about a year as well. Mm. Um, so my idea was to come visit home and, and mm. to do the design work here mm. so that um, 
I can then present this mm. uh, uh, as a final piece in the dissertation. Mm. Uh, I ended up getting COVID and getting mm. stuck in South Africa. Um, but I think it was all meant to be. Mm. We then presented ASA as this concept of um, a, tr- uh, a heritage luxury brand mm. that sits within the contemporary, um, so uses historical analysis, um, identity, and heritage as a way of informing the contemporary, mm. the current zeitgeist. Mm. Um, so the product that we create references various components of this history, whether it's military, whether it's, it's traditional, mm. cultural, um, to create these garments that suit the now, mm. whether that's aesthetic or function. Mm. Um, I wanted to create a product that, that again, serves mm. rather than something to be mm. consumed via a trend. So we really design um, in a simplistic manner. Mm. I don't think I'm making anything that necessarily hasn't been done mm. before, but I think it's the way that we put it together and the narrative that we that create around it. Sp- speak, speaking about those narratives yeah. that, that we create around it, um, I mean, our uh, like formerly known collaboration, M. Jozolo, mm-hmm. happened like last year. Mm-hmm. Um, and also at the cusp of you sort of like introducing the brand or in the process of intru- introducing the brand to the world. Um, tell me about um, that piece. I mean, we have many collaborations together, but it started at M. Zolo first primarily. Um, t- t- talk to me about like um, how that came together because I mean, I think we need to give genesis to that moment, sure. but I would want you to lead that boat so in that conversation. At, at, the, at the time, mm. I'd been working on the brand as part of the dissertation and afterwards for for a, cu- a number of months, about six months or so, um, and at the, and sort of post dissertation because I was I my plan was to work overseas, but I was here, so I thought let me let me continue with this journey. So pitched the brand um, and Daniel of Duck Duck Goose was the one that that decided or, or that gave us the platform. So shout out to Daniel. Flowers, flowers, he's, flowers. Uh, he's been an instrumental figure. Mm journey of the brand mm. but to come back to M. Zolo, which I think was a, a couple of weeks if, if not a couple of months before the official launch mm. um, I wanted to well, I, th- I think you took the lead <laughs> on that by, by <laughs> saying yo I'm going to Joba give me some gums to shoot and at the time because it was something like so personal um, I, I wasn't Sure, but then I know you, right? I know the individual and I trust your creative vision. So I think it was important for me to almost relinquish a little bit of control. And I think what was incredible out of that piece was my creation being interpreted through a different lens. Mm. Um, Obviously, the project was very much in line with the brand manifesto Mm. um, and, and this idea of the previous generation venturing into the city for new opportunities mm. um, was something that, that aligns almost perfectly mm. with the brand manifesto. Mm. Um, but it was strange to me because like, I, I had no, I had no mm. physical input mm. um, into the project. Um, but when I saw it it, it, it was a moment of... Uh, clarity is probably the wrong word to use, but I, I felt that what I was doing could be received... Mm in the way that I wanted it to mm. and could be interpreted by other people rather than just being interpreted by me. Mm. And I think that was the first time, aside from the dissertation, we, we, we ended up doing quite well on the dissertation and in testing the idea. But I think from a, from a local um, perspective, I think that was the first time I saw the, the brand really being embodied by someone other than myself mm. and and it it really it it took me oh how can i say it? it it was like a moment where i felt that i was on the right track mm. one of one of the bigger moments before the launch mm. i mean uh, the, the dissertation is one thing but it's that's not my people mm. engaging with the idea right it's not home Mm. so that was home for me mm. and it was also at the time of the broke boys sh- taking the shit mm. to the top and so the whole energy around that time mm. i could feel in that project mm. um, and then we ended up launching bro like <laughs> 
for me, I think it was pretty crazy that like we did M Josolo and then four weeks later, like you you were launching through Tak Takus. And then I just started working at Tak Takus. I think that like that time was so godly and divine that I can't describe it into words and honestly bro those are some of the best memories of my life and i i don't take that like too like too lightly because it was the first time like a homie of like you know color really like took his consideration and offering or not not the first time but like i mean in the in the constant in the con in the context of like cape town and like yeah. up and coming like your inception and your introduction was already into the high level or sort of like considered because you were sharing a room with Rich Mnisi, Tebe Makuku, all these like incredible South African designers and like you were in a store which is a beautiful concept by the family, Daniel and you know the whole Tak Tak family mm. like you know um, was also became family of me over time um, but I, f- I find it so fascinating bro that I was working there at the time, you were coming in there Take me through that 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 the butterflies that were in your tummy that day, bro. I remember us briefly having a chat like the night before about like, yo, dude, like, are you sure you're ready? You know? Are you sure you're ready for this cock? And I'm like, fuck me, bro. Like, let's just let's, let's just like let's not overthink it. And you were like can't, sending can't me, go back now. can't go back now. And you were sending me, yo, oh, bro, should I rock the bus or should I rock the Gucci? I'm like, fuck, bro, I don't know. But it's your day. That's what I know. You know what I mean? Take me through that. Take me through that, bro. I it was a crazy time. I think what, what really comes to mind is that we, we really do stand on the shoulders of giants. Mm. Um, and I think, again, in my work, this generational mindset is something that I try to touch on all the time. So for me to be able to enter that space, obviously, I, I, I know Daniel since Corner Store days, and I think him giving me that opportunity uh I, I i can't put it into words mm. um that platform i think w- was perfect for mm. for how we introduced the brand mm. and it was it still is surreal mm. um, but at the time it was such an honor and such a surreal moment mm. to be in that same room to share those rails with mm. the names that you've mentioned and mm. more um and it it, it to this day it, it doesn't there's an element of it that almost doesn't feel real mm. but you but you spoke about the divine timing of it mm. and i think that to have you with the store at the time to have daniel and i's relationship lead to me being able to to release the brand there um and then the night it's, uh, itself i mean so mm. many people turned up mm. i met so many people mm. um i didn't really expect it to mm. go that well um and so every interview that I did after that, I was uh. like, shit, I don't know what happens next. <laughs> because uh. Uh, what I had thought was going to happen far exceeded my expectations. Mm. Um, so the store really gave me that platform to be mm. able to put what I'm doing out to the public. Mm. Um, and I think everything after that was just beyond what I ever expected. Mm. Um, so that, that was the experience in a nutshell, I think crazy um, bro it's difficult it's difficult to to put into words mm, mm. um but it but it's definitely something that i will always a, a moment that i will always hold very close to me mm. um it, it's different when when people really believe in you like that mm. and i mean even even sort of leading up to that moment mm. the support that i had from th- the greater creative community mm. in south africa not only daniel but Guys like Wanda mm. messaging me and telling me, you know, they, they really love what I'm mm. doing and they support what I'm doing. Lucanio uh, buying your first trousers. Lucanio being my first customer <laughs> when he was in Paris accepting the Carl Lagerfeld Award. Um, there's a note that you had from that time uh, where there were some alterations that needed to be done to his trousers. I've got that note and it, it, it needs a frame at some point because of how special that is. Um, and so, so to have those individuals and guys like Xavier, um, Matt Binary, Annalisa, all showing the support. I mean, Matt and Annalisa, among a few other individuals, uh, form part of my dissertation mm. uh, research process. Mm. But but to have that word of support and that mm. word of encouragement and mm. then beyond that, the platform and the financial support of Lucanio, say, mm. buying product from me, mm. um, 
again, difficult to put into words, mm. but I think the the depth of that, mm. um, it, I, I reflect on it all the time because mm. sometimes the shit's hard mm. um, and you're not really sure what to do next, where to go next, or mm. how to do this, but, but it's really the acceptance of the community, mm. the support of the community, not mm. just the people that we've mentioned, but mm. everybody that shows up, everybody that... That buys mm. product. I mean, we sold out of almost everything, mm. which is nuts. Mm. Um, so that that was just such a crazy time, mm. um, and so many things happened after mm. that. But, but I don't know if we we should wrap that duck that goose time up. not wrap it up, but the the next um, phases after that. Uh, um, what followed after that? Like after besides the immense like um, press that you were doing. Um, what what sort of follow like after that and I, I I wanna I don't wanna I wanna touch on like um the in loving memory piece a bit later mm. but I wanna stick to the time period after the introduction to Cape Town. Mm. Um, what was sort of like the pressures you were facing from a, a company point of view that came with the success? So I think the pressures from from the business side of things is always uh, capital and infrastructure. Um, to be able to find the right people to be able to produce the garments is is so hard. Mm. Um, most factories or CMTs in the country produce with what they call MOQs, minimum order quantities. Mm. So generally, bring the mic a bit closer. Generally, yeah. it's yeah. in it's in the hundreds of units, mm. if not thousands. Mm. Um, so to be able to find people to be able to do ten to any units of mm. the style is is hard. Mm. Um, but things just you know, things had its way of falling into place. Mm. Um, but post-launch, um, what was crazy is, again, the, the response. Um, I think just before the launch, we did the between 10 and 5 piece mm. um, as, a, as a way of, you know, creating awareness around me launching mm. the brand. Um, but then after that, we had Bubblegum, um, which, which was an incredible piece in and of itself we did a crazy shoot with shanti and, mm. and jeremy and, and isham i mean isham talk to me been, about isham he's been crazy and, and I mean, the and the creative relationship that you guys have isham and i initially touched base i think early 2019 mm. isham um, is research, research project project um mm. project coast project. for those who really know no mm. um but um, yeah, man, Isham and I touched base uh, early 2019, around the time when I wanted to, when I was planning on moving, mm. and him and a few other individuals were were sort of tapping into the same thing that I saw to be the the driving force behind the art mm. uh, output of 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 the creative mm. community in mm. Cape Town, and so we we met at the time and we discussed working together. But, you know, it's it's very difficult to get these mm. things off the ground. Mm. So during my time in the UK, we, we had kept the, the channels of conversation open. And for me, it was only right to have him shoot the dissertation lookbook or the project that we presented there. Beautiful um, images. And, mm. I mean, he always comes through mm. with incredible uh, images mm. um, and an incredible, like, interpretation. Mm. I think beyond the image in of itself, I think it's... The interpretation mm. that allows him to to create mm. at that level, um, and so we 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 ended up doing a quick shoot with Shanti and, and Jeremy as well, mm. uh, and Ray Skillshaw. Mm. I mean, so many crazy names mm. coming out of these conversations. <laughs> um, Flowers to everyone. Yeah, man. Yeah. I, mean, I would love to be able to just talk about everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we did that shoot um, at quite an iconic house in Rylands, which mm. if, if people aren't people aren't aware, it's a predominantly Indian Muslim suburb um, in Cape Town. Um, and this house was designed in the 80s. It's, it's super modern. Mm. Um, I, I would imagine it would have been revolutionary for its time, but, mm. you know, because it's in an area like Rylands mm. rather than Constantia or Camps Bay, mm. it's kind of overlooked. Mm. Um, and I've, I've driven past this house so many times. My, a good friend of mine, Junaid Rawut, mm. um, lives next door. Mm. Um, so we shot this piece and... Bubblegum Club then reached out to me to to you know to write a feature on the launch of the brand. I mean the way that Samani, uh, shout out to Samani by the way, but Odwa, the way that yeah. the way that he um, the way that he described the launch um, was 
again so humbling mm. but but the timing of the images and and him reaching mm. out was perfect so we, we released the images alongside the article mm. and that just it, it created a different i guess perspective of how people mm. perceived what i was doing and also allowed like people from Joburg to, to really latch on to mm. what was happening down here mm. um but then what happened after that was was crazy and this is what led to what led to the piece um we we were reached out to by um a new york based company to to apply for an award um and you know looking through the through the past winners everyone sort of did film projects um and so i wanted to do a film project and and who better <laughs> to talk about film than uh, the gorgeous bushman himself <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, yeah man that that was sort of what led up to the project itself mm, mm. and i mean maybe before i talk about what that meant to me i think it's worthwhile talking about what that meant to you uh, th- as as an art piece i i always equate a a a a, a sensitivity a a a lightheartedness a a a emotive attachment to that piece mm. i think the making of it was an extremely taxing exercise for sure um, for two and a half minutes two, for <laughs> two and a half minutes and um I, i think what we were able to put together really outweighs our creative it wasn't even about me and mm. you or asa sadan or the, okay, it was about asa sadan it was but led it by a, it has a broader meaning it, it has, it a, has a, broader a, a, a broader relevance a broader, broader connection and like when i when i when i look at our muse mira jean uh, it, it was it was it was it was sort of like so like i don't know there was a divinity to it that mm. i can't I- explain um I, i i i'm humbled that you you know entrusted me to you know in- incorporate this vision in a way that you know we could collaborate live, collaborate collaboratively <laughs> execute mm. and i think it sunk in when when we had just dropped and you had um called me and you're like um i i showed this piece to my cousin or older brother i'm not my sure older brother. your older brother and he was bursting out in tears and yeah. i i i i i don't know like that really that was that was one of the moments that i had to myself and i told myself okay i'm definitely following my calling mm. Yeah and I think the same can be said for me mm. uh, for those who don't know the film was dedicated to mm. to generations of women mm. um within my family that that have inspired what we're doing today mm. um and again the divine timing is always something that comes up mm. I think while we were busy shooting that project um for the one club which mm. is which is the New York based company uh Natal reaches out to us mm. to, to do a feature and I mentioned to Helen who's the the editorial director um shout out to Helen for giving flowers. us the opportunity eternal um, flowers again so so it was at the same time that we were doing that project so I said to Helen yo like why don't we premiere the film on Natal mm. as the as the piece itself mm. um so that stemmed from the mm. project um and then I don't know if I'm allowed to talk on this yet but there's something else coming up with Natal mm. um, in London as well mm. soon. Mm. So so that happened we got a position on an accelerator mm. um as a result of that video. Mm. Um so as you say it it was really one of those moments like in Jesolo mm. like the launch mm. where it just affirms mm. um the trajectory and the path mm. and the calling. Mm. Um because I think a lot of the time the shit is hard mm. <laughs> and all of the time all of the time yeah, and, it's, <laughs> and it's hard to monetize mm. Mm. and so sometimes you find yourself thinking fuck should i have gone into mm. corporate should i have taken a fucking mm. 95 but it's times like that where it really affirms what we doing mm. um and this idea of it being bigger than ourselves and mm. the, the greater the greater work of art mm. um so that that was nuts and and again what stemmed from that video were two new stockists mm. so i mean by the time people see this um, mm. we will we'll be preparing to release um with AKJP the the new offering um under the title what should what should people expect from it's AKJP and who's the second and and the pot plant club what what should people expect from this um new offerings and um yeah ideally 
please tell me like how you feeling building up to these two respective launches so so basically the way that we're going to structure it is um AKJP will take on the full offering under the title generational succession um again talking on the, the different themes repeat of the that brand. generational succession um with the idea of taking what previous generations have built for mm. us mm. and building upon that standing on the shoulders mm. of giants mm. and taking it further mm. um but then sort of a more uh, a more practical meaning mm. um, we i try not to design by collection mm. uh, for a number of reasons uh, a i don't have the fucking mm. infrastructure to do that and mm. b i don't want to feed into the cycle of new all the time mm. um i want to build like like um muji <laughs> yeah can you hear can you hear yeah so yeah exactly mm. this idea of of building better mm. rather than building new mm. all the time mm. um so there will be a lot of silhouettes that we have been offered mm. um, that we have offered previously mm. um a lot of which have sold out so we'll be restocking on some of that and then mm. um adding five or six new styles um as an offering so so the way that we the way that we create these offerings is mm. we take the feedback from the audience mm. or, or the community mm. and we'll add or subtract on the offering mm. based on that mm. a lot of it also has to do with um access to fabrications mm. and shit like that mm. um so some of the stuff we just can't get again for sure um that's that's just how it goes yeah for so, sure so yeah it's it's AKJP will be housing the full collection or the full offering mm. um with and then Duck Duck Goose and Pot Blonde Club will be more consolidated. Mm. Uh, Daniel's a very specific guy who knows what he likes. For sure. <laughs> um <laughs> and the same thing with um with the Pot Blonde Pot Club. Blonde Club. Um and it will be interesting for me to see e- each each um shop or retailer um has their own audience. Um and so it will be interesting for me to see how how each audience or each group of people mm. adopts what we do cuz it's three different spaces no. well i would put akjp in one space but pot blonde club is like a different vibe i think the pot blonde club it sort of harnesses that cornerstone energy mm. um, and so even though it's more sort of towards the street culture mm. um again that's a part of my experience it's a part of my influence, influence it's a part yeah. of my heritage yeah so uh, it's it's an it's incredible to be adopted by the space mm. um as well as akjp i mean i've for been sure. shopping there for such a long mm. time um so it's crazy to 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 be able to have my product in there as mm. well uh, what's also fucking crazy is is going from one stockist and f- four styles to like 10 styles wow. tripling production wow. i think we went from like 100 units to like over 300 now wow um <laughs> which is it's <laughs> nuts to, mm. to i mean just dealing with that from a business aspect is is fucking hard um and you're you doing know, all of this by yourself i am um together with i am i think it, it, it's again this this um comparison between the individual and and the collective mm. um i don't i I do everything by myself but i also don't do anything myself really mm. um i provide the direction for everything mm. so whether that's comment whether that's the shoot mm. video mm. um how we roll out the press mm. and all that. i do all of that myself mm. Mm. but with other people always mm. um so it's, it's it's an interesting journey and it's an interesting role to mm. play mm. um and and for it to be my own thing my for own sure. my own enterprise for sure is something quite special lastly bro um yeah it's like we touched on so many beautiful <laughs> emblems of like you know the, the 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 past leading up now and where we're going cuz i would like to believe like this is still the infancy Definitely. we haven't scratched the surface i mean we only s- we're only 6 7 <laughs> months in now yeah and it's the formally it's crazy bro i don't think i've ever seen a brand introduction like yours ever in a Thank climate you. of Thank south you. africa um i think we can all attest to this like um and this i don't know like like luxurious like taste levels like label called it experts of what did he call it again in the in the past interview sure. oh. I've, I've watched that shit so many times oh dude you know what i mean oh. uh and I, I um and i think he called it a fashion house a fashion a fashion house yeah. which it which it's it's, it's yeah. all getting there you, you know what i mean and there. um yeah bro i just wanted to say like 
um what message do you sort of like want to have there to say what what message do you have to say to um a young imran out there in the skirts of rylands ronda bosch crawford athlone who has a I say a young Imran, I mean a young person like you mm. or a, a younger version of mm. you or kid or mm. anywhere, you know, that is watching this conversation. Um, what is sort of like the best advice you received and the worst advice you received and what they should do, you know, to really rel- relinquish and trust themselves to take the steps necessary towards their dreams? Man, um, I think there, there's so many layers to that. Um, I think... You mentioned the worst advice, um, and I think even the worst advice ended up being the best advice. Wow! I think that that advice that I took on or decided to to go with, sort of, I I would end up hitting a brick wall and having to change my direction. So in a way, I regard that as good advice. Um, th- same thing with the with the bad advice that I decided to reject in favor of my own vision. Mm. Also had its way of affirming itself. Um, so I would say that I think the most important thing is just to seek knowledge. Whatever means you have available to you, whatever people you have around you, um, gain as much knowledge as possible. I think for me, I, I worked on gaining knowledge for about six or seven years before actually putting my spade in the ground for my own thing. Yeah, I did styling and shit on the side and, and stuff like that to, to just continually hone in on my own creative vision mm, mm. i think what happened what what helped me a lot was to be able to divorce my creative practice from my vocation or from mm. my my income mm. um okay yes i worked as a designer but mm. separate from my own creative practice mm. and that allowed me to to really just hone in on my own vision mm. um i think what was also special to me was living through all of those moments, um, all of those different times uh, of, of immense change, mm. uh, Im- immense enlightenment. Mm. I think one thing we didn't touch on was the fees must fall, roads must fall movement and, and how that shaped my, my perspective mm. at the time of gaining this knowledge um, and a conversation for another day. Um, but what, what we're experiencing now is, is a movement. Mm. and a moment mm. um, for me I, I liken it to Bauhaus and Dadaism mm. and, and, and modernism mm. I, I liken it to um, to how can I say the anti-fashion movement mm. of the 90s if anyone hasn't seen that documentary it's on YouTube it's mm. crazy anti-fashion in the 90s mm. really um, those individuals Antwerp 6 mm. um, Raf Simmons Yoji Yamamoto Reikawakubo all of those individuals at the time that they were living through really put forward their own vision which Mm. which was very different to to the flavor of the day um and i think i'm trying to do something similar i think we live in a similar time where where there's so much hardship there's so much change there's so much challenge um and to to really just wade through all of that with a clear vision that that requires a lot of development over time I think is important, and like I said, to, to today we're seeing this this movement, this, this special moment um, in South Africa uh, within all creative disciplines. All of the names that we've mentioned in this conversation and more are all a part of this movement. Some are, are pioneers, and and the rest of us are learning and standing on their shoulders. But just take it in. I think in five, ten, twenty years' time, we're mm. going to look back on this time. Mm. Um, and and really see it as a pivotal moment mm. um, in our home, in mm. our industry, uh, in our individual enterprises. Um, so yeah, man, that would be my advice: is to gain the knowledge, take your time, hone in on your vision, and just live in this moment, and and take the lessons from it, and and put it forward for the next generation. I thank you, my brother. <laughs>